Welcome to the Leaders in Housing Counseling Call. We're very glad you're here. We have a very strong turnout today, and thank you, everybody, for signing, for joining early so that uh, we're going to start right on time, as we always do. And I know there's some newcomers to our calls, um, uh, and I'll talk to you about how to sign up for the uh, uh, our list in the future um, uh, later in the call. But uh, certainly, if, if you like what you hear, we regularly do these sessions, and we provide a lot more information on, on uh, housing counseling issues and advocacy to strengthen our work and, and do the strengthen the good work that you do in the field. So if you're not already on the Leaders in Housing Counseling listserv, please uh, let us know, and you can do that through our website. Um, we're going to um, run through a quick overview of just what the agenda is for today. Um, uh, Latika Wesley will give us an overview on the legislative work we're doing. Um, valuable stuff, and especially around housing counseling funding, but um, uh, we, we, we're working on multiple angles here to really strengthen the housing counseling world um, in Congress. And then um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, just some updates of, of activities we're doing and things that uh, you should know about, and hopefully some of them you might provide us with insight and um, help us figure out what the right positions are on the work we're doing. The main part of our call is going to be around the American Rescue Plan, and we have booked so that normally these calls are an hour long, and we're able to go for two hours um, in case there's enough questions that people want to have answered. We do want to be able to address people as much as we can about um, where things are at, um, and uh, we're pleased to have Lisa Sitkin again from the National Housing Law Project to give us um, an overview on the rental side of this, which definitely affects um, the work that many of you are doing on, on um, uh, rental counseling. Um, Casey Bromberg, um, who's a specialist on unemployment insurance, and there's an unemployment um, provision in there. We think this is very important for our work, for our clients to make sure that they actually um, take advantage of the, uh, um, take advantage of the unemployment piece. And apparently, um, uh, we're hearing that people are having some trouble getting in, and Casey was very helpful last time in talking about what the best strategies are to, to help your clients. Um, Joseph Sant from the Center for New York City Neighborhoods will be with us to talk about the um, uh, housing counseling provision in the $100 million and also the, uh, um, the homeowner assistance fund, which is uh, to help um, homeowners uh, with direct funding and um, also I'm sure touch on the work that um, advocates are doing to uh, uh, improve the availability of that money with, uh, with Treasury. Um, and then we're going to have a, a panel of um, our people who've been deep in the field on um, um, Hardest Hit and NFMC and just them talking about how um, uh, what their view is about how to prepare for our organizations, their organizations, and um, suggestions for you about how to prepare for um, uh, the upcoming funding and uh, what might be useful, how to think about it, um, uh, whether to communicate with local um, um, state agency providers or anything like that to uh, lay the groundwork so that once money is flowing that we can be as effective as possible. We'll have Lou Tisler from the National Neighbor Works Association. We'll have Lot Diaz from Unidos US. And a lot of courses, not only often on these calls, but uh, a member of, the, of our advisory board for NHRC. And Carrie Harris from D&E, um, uh, and all of them have lots of expertise in, in the actual implementing of these kind of programs, and we want to be able to take advantage of that. Um, we'll have plenty of time for question and answer and discussion, and please use the um, um, chat box to let us know what you'd like to have included, questions you'd like to do. Um, LA will help, as always, feed the, the questions, and we'll be um, able to uh, um, take as many as we can and um, have the panel address all that we can. We will do, after, right after Lisa Sitkin's portion, she's not able to stay, we'll do a Q&A for her if you've got some questions specifically on that. So be sure to put those in early um, and then please feel free to, um, while people are talking, uh, to throw in uh, questions for the other presenters. 
We'll do a quick plug on NHRC membership. Really appreciate all the support people are showing. This really means a lot. And there's a little cheer that goes on in the office when uh, new members come in. And, and we really appreciate uh, the, the level of renewals. We know this is a tough time for organizations in terms of funding and really understand that um, you're being a member right now is, and um, supporting us on membership dues is, is sometimes it's quite a commitment. Um, and with, so with that note, we're going to dive in and let's start out with um, uh, Latika and um, give us a sense of what's happening on the legislative side. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you all to thank you all for joining today's call. Um, this call is actually about the stimulus bill, what it means for housing counselors. If you were on the last call, um, the stimulus bill was in the House um, waiting to be passed there. The president actually signed the bill um, last Saturday or last Thursday, actually seven days ago today. So we're uh, happy to see that $1.9 trillion, million, trillion dollars, um, will go to help um, COVID related issues, specifically housing counseling, homeowner relief, um, and emergency, emergency rental assistance. The panelists will delve deeper into those um, as the call progresses. Um, with regard to the FY 2022 appropriations, um, we're gearing up right now to submit our bid for the $100 million ask um, to be appropriated for housing counseling. So be on the lookout for um, appropriation request letters. Um, each rep and senator can write their respective committee committees. Our committee is the T-HUD committee. We're going to do a push to try to get our representatives to add counseling at $100 million for the base funding for FY 2022. Um, and so, you know, this is an important part of the funding process for the budget um, and hearing from you would be uh, the conversation would get elevated um, and hopefully we can get our get what we're asking for with regard to the $100 million. We'll also be rolling out our sign on letters next week. Be on the lookout for those. Uh, we may ask you to join some key meetings with your representatives. Um, and again, it's important that they hear from you, the people who are doing the work on the ground. Um, and understand that, you know, housing counseling is extremely important today than it ever has been. Um, so we just ask that you please be re responsive. Um, your input is very, very valuable. And with that, I'll hand it back over. Thank you, Latika. And, um, you know, Latika's two weeks in the job and already taking charge, so it's great. Um, please keep an eye out for emails and postings on the listserv. Um, we, uh, uh, we're going to have the sign on letter moving next week. And as she said, um, and then, um, you will have an opportunity to write your house and Senate members, um, asking them to talk to the appropriators about, um, supporting hundred million dollars, um, kind of a big leap from 57.5, which was this year's current fund. Um, definitely have the demand for it. We definitely have the need. Um, and it's, uh, 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 the idea is that we try to really have the housing counseling base funding be much more substantial so that you can support the baseline work that you're doing. And, uh, um, we'll continue pushing on this, uh, on this particular side. So keep an eye out for Latika's emails. I'm going to move forward, um, uh, onto, we have a new staff member. So Ebony Cartwright is our new program associate. Um, she comes with some deep experience uh, in administrative systems and some of our um, uh, client relationship um, uh, programming and donor programming that we um, uh, need to really strengthen and uh, a lot of customer service relationship. So Ebony, are, are you able to patch in here? I am. Uh, Bruce, how are you? Hello, everyone. Glad to have you. We're just, uh, we're just welcoming you onto staff. And uh, uh, if, uh, if, if uh, there may be some time when um, she's a resource for you, and so hoping you all recognize her, um, her name. And uh, uh, if, if that's the case, please, please jump on. She's going to try to make our systems work much better. <laughs> and I know sometimes they aren't perfect, so we're, we're working on perfect now. Absolutely. Thank you again, Bruce. Good. Thanks, Ebony. Okay. So let me just hit on a few high points here. Um, as we all know, um, we have a new HUD secretary, Marsha Fudge, very exciting, um, but dynamic, is, look, is deeply aware about the racial issues in housing in this country um, and some of the economic justice issues. 
uh, that we have um, all been concerned about. Um, we, uh, we're reaching out to have an initial meeting and kind of lay out housing counseling as a key piece to um, uh, implementing some important programs at HUD and also talking with, with her about ways that we think HUD programs could run better and maybe FHA loan, loans could be uh, more, um, uh, could be fairer for um, the people who borrow it. We think that she'll, this will be a receptive year and so um, very hopeful that uh, something will happen we'll be able to do something soon and, and set the tone for the work we do over the course of the next year with HUD. And um, so very good news there. We'll, we'll, we'll see what, what happens. Just got the invite out from, uh, this morning to, to the HUD. So with Black Home Ownership, Black Home Ownership Collaborative, um, and we've talked about this before, it's a collaborative of, of a broad range of uh, industry, of advocacy, of um, policy people um, really trying to figure out how to move the dial on home ownership and with a goal of 3 million new net homeowners over the next 10 years. Um, so not just maintaining where we are, but uh, really trying to tackle the, the 30 percentage points difference between black home ownership and white home ownership in this country. Um, uh, I um, am the co-chair along with for, for housing counseling and down payment assistance along with Bailey Childress from NeighborWorks America and Simone Griffin from Home Free USA. A number of people on this call have participated in, in, in some of the calls. Um, I think they're very close and we will post when there's a final, because we have seven point um, uh, uh, set of uh, concepts that are critical to moving this forward, housing counseling figures, um, substantially in there, um, uh, down payment assistance is substantially in there, but also things like improving the way the credit is done, dealing with student loans, um, uh, really trying to get into the nitty gritty of what are the barriers that have been preventing uh, uh, more extensive home ownership opportunities, and especially with the black community, though a lot of this will work, will apply to um, a broader community as well. Um, and very good news is that um, uh, Chairwoman Maxine Waters has introduced the Down Payment Equity Act, and um, we worked closely with her. And uh, the, the work with the Black Home Ownership Collaborative was was very influential on their legislation. Um, they're targeting substantial amounts of money that would go for down payment assistance, and it would be aimed at especially at first generation home buyers, and not just um, uh, first time home buyers, but also first generation, um, with some exceptions. So if you, if your family lost their house because of a foreclosure, um, during the crisis or a variety of things like that, that, um, there are some opportunities to, for them to be included. Um, uh, this wouldn't be the only down payment assistance program in America. The others will still exist. And the idea would be that, that this would be stackable to, um, combine with them to give, targeted people a real leg up and we hope some increased flexibility. And um, uh, the, the goal would be to have uh, grants of up to $20,000 and for some uh, socially and um, economically disadvantaged populations, uh, $25,000. Um, so we're, we're in the very early stages of this. The first draft has been introduced, um, but we think that this says, you know, tremendous support and we are also looking in the Senate to see if there might be some corresponding legislation or support there to do that as well. Um, there is a housing counseling requirement, though they also have a provision there that um, people who are eminently qualified um, that uh, for a mortgage that uh, they'd be able to waive counseling, but um, we hope that uh, this will get people into counseling who could use our help the most and where we could be the most active in terms of really impacting the populations we're most concerned about. So um, I'm going to quickly run through um, sort of the uh, set of big topics that we're talking about and thinking about. Um, and uh, we will, we'll have opportunities um, in, in the next few weeks and months to talk about this in more length. But just to let you know what, where we're at on key issues. So there's been a a conversation with the 30 some odd um, housing counseling program leaders um, 
on how to implement the $100 million for COVID-19 housing counseling funding. Um, NeighborWorks, of course, is, is doing this. Um, we have lots of experience. We, um, they, they have lots of experience, and um, we uh, uh, think this could be a great program, but we wanted to really give feedback based on experience we've had with other programs, including, of course, the NFMC program, which they ran um, in the past. So this will, um, we'll, we'll have some proposals coming out of this shortly. Um, there's been a lot of work that's happened in the last week. Um, and uh, my understanding is also that uh, that uh, NeighborWorks will do some kind of a, um, uh, a broader session to get input on their planning. So um, there'll be opportunities for all of us to have input on this on the process. And um, you know, we appreciate the transparency there. Um, we will also have a major discussion after we've completed this one on uh, how to make the HUD housing counseling dollars more effective for agencies. So different than other federal contracts, um, HUD housing counseling has been much more restrictive in what you can pay for in terms of program related expenses and in terms of how you can use uh, your, um, uh, how, can you, how you can use your dollars for salaries. And um, so what we wanted to do is to convene a group of um, people who actually look at these budgets in, in your organizations and, and have some deep knowledge of this so we can make a set of proposals. Um, uh, as you know, David Berenbaum is now at the Office of Housing Counseling and is very interested and attuned to try to figure out how to make things work better. So we think this is the right time to have this conversation and hopefully what we can do is increase the value of the dollars that we get from HUD so that it's more, you're more able to meet your budgetary needs um, and deliver the services uh, without having um, uh, to scramble to try to get so more money to supplement what, um, um, what, you're, what you're doing on those services. So certainly if you've got some expertise in this area and some thoughts, email me. Um, we will, we're very, very interested in um, moving forward. And then lastly, um, we are going to, after that, do another discussion, and it will be a, how to build housing counseling capacity. Um, we will hopefully have a lot more money coming into our system. It means that we need to increase staff. We need to increase, increase our skill set. We need to think about what kind of technologies could be helpful and how to pay for them. Um, uh, training, I think, and marketing. These are all kind of critical issues for us. And so we'll have an ongoing conversation about how to, how we can use the next couple months to really build up um, our capacity and um, make, um, um, get us a position for what will probably be substantial work to be doing on um, renters who are coming off of um, the moratoria and uh, homeowners who are dealing with the, um, um, uh, with, uh, who are coming up for parents. And on top of that, uh, we really hope we'll have some substantial down payment assistance programs in the future. So a lot to do and exciting and it's exciting times. Uh, um, I'll say one more quick thing, which I think we need to think about how to um, maybe elevate more in our work that one of the real values uh, that housing counseling that you bring to this work is the sense of being mission driven about the work. And that matters, that matters a lot. And um, so we're not just, you know, going through the paces, we really do work to try to figure out the best solutions for our clients. And that that sense of mission really is integral to our work. And um, we, um, it's really valuable for us to um, um, make sure that that our ability to do this is 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 in the in the housing process, so that um, we are able to really help people when they need it the most. Um, and you know, it's no big secret that you know we help people with understanding the process and finances and stuff like that. But there's some serious source of emotional support here, and um, this is. The sort of trusted advisor kind of role is critical to what we do, and um, we should ensure that um, policymakers and others understand that um, 
can we help in a way that might be different than just moving the paper through our systems? Okay, well, with that note, um, let's dive in. And um, as you know, the American Rescue Plan, go ahead. A quick question that came through, Bruce. Somebody w was interested yes. in learning if they could join the Black Home Ownership Collaborative. Um, well, so shoot me an email. Um, I, I'm not sure how much more is going to be happening on the, um, I think it's all on implementation rather than program design, but shoot me an email. That's fine. And, and let's, figure out, let's figure that out. But yeah, that'd be good. Just shoot me an email. Thanks. Um, okay. So um, American Rescue Plan. So uh, Lisa Sitkin um, has always been a clear and very helpful voice in helping us understand and um, and and how to implement um, um, housing policy. Uh, and so we're asking her to help us understand what's happening with the rental assistance and how housing counselors might be able to uh, be helpful in all this. Lisa. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so what I'm going to talk about um, specifically is the emergency rental assistance piece of the recently passed American Rescue Plan Act. Um, but first, by way of background, I just want to remind everyone, and I'm sure you're well aware of this, that um, in the um, appropriations from uh, the end of last year, there was an initial um, $25 billion appropriated for emergency rental assistance. Um, and I know in California where I am, um, the applications, at least for the state part of that program, just opened this Monday. Um, I have not kept track of exactly the timing um, in other states, and uh, there are other localities in California that are on a slightly different schedule from the state. It's very complicated here in California, unfortunately. Um, but those programs are rolling out, and um, certainly um, one of the first things to uh, check when you are working with a tenant who may need this assistance is um, what program or programs, because there may be overlapping programs, are available in the jurisdiction um, and then, you know, arming yourself with whatever information is available about um, how that application process works and um, understanding the eligibility. Um, there are high level uh, eligibility rules that I'll talk about in a minute um, at the federal level that are coming out of the Treasury Department because um, the money is flowing through Treasury for, for these um, uh, funds. But um, each state and in some cases larger jurisdictions um, can do overlays of um, additional um, types of eligibility requirements within certain you know, restrictions by, by the Treasury. Uh, so it's going to look different in different places. And um, I'm not able to sort of give you the rundown of what it looks like in every different place. But I will give you kind of the federal overview and um, very happy to answer questions at the end of this um, if people have them and to the extent that I can. So um, that initial 25 billion rolled out. And the main thing to know about this new tranche of money that um, was included in the American Rescue Plan is that um, it, it totals just about 27 and a half billion. Um, the actual <coughs> emergency rental assistance that's kind of the follow on to that first 25 billion um, is about 21.55 billion. Um, and again, that will run through the Treasury Department uh, and subject to Treasury Department guidance, which um, is kind of rolling out in phases. So there was initial guidance that was somewhat unfortunate from the past administration. There was an update to that um, several weeks ago, another update or two updates, I think, in the last couple weeks. So we're keeping an eye on that. Um, and for the most part, um, we're pleased with the changes that were made to the initial guidance uh, in terms of making these funds, you know, openly more available, more accessible. Um, there are some problems and we're talking to Treasury, but uh, so 
if you are familiar, because I think we have talked before, I'm trying to remember, I think I presented maybe on the original emergency rental assistance or you've heard about it. Um, this new pot of money um, is basically going to function uh, the same way uh, in terms of um, going to the states and larger jurisdictions. And then um, presumably there will now be pipelines and infrastructure in place that have been stood up for that first 25 billion. And this money will essentially flow through those same pipes. Um, there are some um, changes just to be aware of. Um, one is that there is um, kind of a set aside of about two and a half billion dollars that's going to be distributed to um, high need communities. This is something we had really pushed for that, you know, there should be an emphasis on getting funds to places where um, there is a high concentration of very low income renter households who are um, heavily rent burdened um and uh places where folks are living in substandard or overcrowded conditions very high rental market costs and very high unemployment so all of those kind of qualify as the high needs but what will that that will look like if you're in such a community is just that there should be slightly more money available there than in a community that's that's not deemed to be and and as of yet that those determinations about sort of what qualifies, I don't believe have been made. So uh, continue to keep an eye on that. Um, there is some additional funding outside of the 21 and a half billion that is for um, tribal and rural uh, tenants, um, a lot of which will uh, involve people in um, RD or USDA funded um, rental properties. And that's kind of a separate pot. Um, but in terms of how the money will be allocated, um, the, the one difference from the first 25 billion is that initial um, pot of money basically just went out the door, the whole thing. Um, they are slowing it down a bit this time so that um, about 40% of the funds are gonna go to grantees um, within the first 60 days. So let's see, the American Rescue Plan past March 11th. So that should be, you know, getting out to the states and localities um, by mid-May. And um, there also uh, are some additional uses that the funds can be put to in the future um, as long as the the grantee has, has spent down about 75% of the funds. I think that piece of it is probably less relevant for this group. Um, but, uh, you know, if you have questions about it, I'm happy to address it. Um, so eligibility has basically remained the same um, from the first round. Uh, and just to remind you of that, um, a household is eligible for the emergency rental assistance if one or more individuals um, has qualified. These are, you have to tick all of these boxes. Um, has qualified for unemployment benefits or experienced a reduction in household income or incurred significant costs or experienced other financial hardship during or due indirectly or directly to the pandemic. So that number one box that has to be ticked is actually quite broad um, in that it allows for sort of a catch-all. So um, I think most people who come in the door who um, are, you know, in arrears on their rent and have had one form or another of financial hardship um, should be able to meet that particular um, requirement. Uh, the unemployment benefits um, is just one, one option there. Um, so that's fairly broad. Uh, the second requirement is that they can demonstrate a risk of experiencing homelessness or housing instability. Um, to my mind, that's sort of a ridiculous requirement because if you are behind on rent, I think by definition you are experiencing housing instability because you are at risk of being evicted um, when whatever applicable moratorium that, that may be protecting you um, ends. So um, it's not clear to us exactly how, how that is being interpreted or enforced. But again, I think that folks with you know, significant rent arrears 
um, should be able to satisfy that. Uh, and then there is um, a broad um, income restriction of being um, at or below uh, 80 percent of AMI. Um, this time around, there there is some flexibility for I think at the treasury level, uh, for and even at at the local level um, in some cases for some flexibility in that AMI cutoff. Um, so we'll have to see. I mean, that's going to be something that should show up in the materials about whatever your local program is. Um, but the the basic default rule is going to be the 80% AMI cutoff, and then just be aware uh, that there might be some exceptions to that. So you should look closely at your local program. Um, states and localities are required to prioritize households that are below 50% of AMI. Um, or those uh, who are unemployed or have been unemployed for 90 days or more. Um, states and localities, as I said, have some flexibility. They can uh, choose to do additional types of prioritization of funds as long as it sort of complies within the larger um, treasury uh, scheme. The use of the funds um, is fairly broad, maybe not as broad as we would like, but uh, they can be used for a number of different things, including um, back rent. Uh, there is an allowance for forward rent, so prospective rent, um, which, you know, if somebody hasn't been able to pay and is still not back at work, uh, you know, paying down their arrears is great, but if they can't pay next month, um, it's not going to help them for very long. Uh, I will say that in California, which I'm most aware of how you know the program is being rolled out here, um, I would say in general the big, the larger state program is being very stingy about prospective rent. Um, I don't know if that's going to change, um, you know, be different in different places, but or change as this new money comes down the road. Um, but that's something that we're looking for. So back rent is almost always going to be, you know, what you can be assured of someone being able to get. The prospect of rent um, is usually <clears throat> more limited. Um, and, uh, you know, it'll just, as I said, again and again, depend on where you are. Um, this can cover rent, but also utility payments um, and other housing expenses. Um, and I'll talk about those in a moment. And the assistance can be provided to cover up to 18 months of these expenses for any given uh, tenant household. Um, there is a set aside of no more than 10% for case management and other um, housing stability uh, services. And 15%, um, which is higher than it was in the first round for um, administrative costs for the state or local government. Uh, the money um, has to uh, be spent by, uh, in total, the funds provided are, are available through September 30th, 2025, so a pretty long timeline. But before then, there are some kind of deadlines um, by March 31st, 2022, so about a year from now, um, if the funds haven't been spent down, um, the Treasury Secretary can actually recapture them and uh, reallocate to other states or localities. Um, and um, as I mentioned before, if uh, the grantee has, has uh, spent at least 20, 75% of their allocation, they can actually shift the use of that to some affordable housing um, and anti-eviction uh, costs. So, um, Oh, and then one other thing is that the original um, emergency rental assistance pot of money, that 25 billion, was actually supposed to be spent by the end of this year, by December 31st. Um, and that deadline has been extended to um, September 30th of 2022. So giving some more flexibility. But uh, that 18 months of assistance that any given tenant household um, is entitled to, or is eligible for, I should say, nobody's clearly entitled, I guess. Um, that's the money from both pots. So that'll be treated as, you know, kind of one, one set of assistance, regardless of kind of which pot of money it came from. I think from the point of view of, 
you guys and the tenants that you um, will be working with, uh, there's not going to be a huge difference on the ground um, in how um, that money looks and how the programs look. There are, as I said, going to be some adjustments in terms of prioritizing high needs communities and um, certain uh, very low income um, households. But uh, for the most part, I think that that it's not going to look that different. It's just, you know, essentially not quite double, but another twenty one point five five billion dollars um, that that's going to be out there on the ground um, available. I think that the. Um, the challenge for tenants um, and for those who are trying to help them <laughs> through this uh, is going to be um, in, you know, figuring out, sort of navigating, identifying where you apply and how that works, navigating that um, system, and also importantly, interacting with the landlord because. Um, again, this will be set up slightly differently in, in different jurisdictions, but this program is set up um, kind of the default uh, arrangement is that it is uh, the landlord who kind of applies. Um, that doesn't mean tenants can't go ahead and apply. And um, I know here in California, like when a tenant applies at first, uh, there's outreach then that's done to the landlord to try to get them to, you know, kind of enter their information into the system and participate. Um, but the challenge that we're anticipating, and I think already starting to see, is that not all landlords are going to be willing to participate um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and uh, there is a provision that allows for um, funds to go directly to tenants, but that's sort of up to the program level. So the grantee, you know, in the locality or at the state level, deciding um, how they're going to kind of run that. Um, for an example, which I consider to be unfortunate, in California, um, it is now set up, at least for the statewide program, that um, a landlord can apply um, on behalf of, you know, their lower income um, eligible tenants, the tenant has to also, you know, input their information if it's the landlord who initiates it. Um, and the landlord can get 80% um, of the back rent as long as they agree to forgive the remaining 20%. So, you know, for some landlords, that's enough of an incentive. For others, that may not be. We'll see. But uh, if the landlord does not agree to participate, does not choose to participate, which is their prerogative, um, then the tenant can apply, but they can only get 25% of the back rent. Um, and that is tied to our current eviction moratorium, which requires people to pay 25% of their rent to be protected. So um, that's not going to go far to solving people's bigger problems with their rent arrears, as you can tell. I don't know um, exactly how it's playing out in other places. If any of you on the call have some information about how the programs are rolling out in your locality, it would be really interesting for us to hear about that too. Um, but uh, I think, as I say, the biggest challenges are going to be navigating whatever the application process is, and then um, kind of navigating the interaction, the way that you know, there's interplay with the landlord and whether they will or won't um, participate. One thing I'll just flag, and I know I should stop now, is um, that we are starting to see some landlords who are actually using the availability of these funds kind of um, as leverage to try to push their tenants out. So even though a tenant might be protected by California's current um, eviction moratorium or eviction restrictions, I think is a better word, uh, the landlord is saying, look, I'll participate and take the 80% and forgive the 20% if you agree, sign this and agree that you'll get out. And of course, the purpose of these funds is try to keep people housed. It's not just to sort of put back rent in the pockets of landlords who, you know, haven't been getting it. So, 
Um, it's very troubling to hear stories like that. I don't think that the story that came across our listserv about that issue yesterday is going to be an isolated incident. So that's definitely something to be watching for um, and definitely a reason to um, you know, make sure that you have connections and um, referral options that, that you can kind of uh implement quickly to your local legal aid because um there are going to be situations where uh there are legal issues um surrounding um how these funds get rolled out and how people can and can't access them i will stop there um, and see if there are any questions or if anybody wants to share anything that that they know about um, how these programs are looking in other places than california so Lisa, this is Bruce. Let me ask one quick question. Do you know if there's some place where a counselor could go to see uh, a centralized list of the of who's implementing each of these um, uh, rental programs so they know where to go in, a, in their locality? Sure. So um, the Treasury Department, um, uh, if you look up rental assistance on the Treasury Department, and I, I, I can after this send you and Ellie some links that you can share with folks, but um, they have the list of allocations. So that would show um, obviously all the states and territories, you know, get their piece, but um, it will also show the larger jurisdictions. It's over 200,000 that have gotten direct grants um, in addition to those states. So, so you can see, you know, who those players are. Um, how how the information is being made available is different from state to state here you know there's a particular state agency that's kind of housing all of the information about both the state and local programs um, i would definitely start with the state housing finance agency because i think those um, agencies are are going to be very involved although i will say in california that's not the key agency but in many states it will be um, and then uh, there also is um, a list that's being updated, I think quite regularly, that is maintained by the National uh, Low Income Housing Coalition. I know you guys have had speakers from them um, on these calls. Uh, and again, I can send you this link. Um, I'm sorry not to have slides for today. It's just been a crazy week. But uh, that's probably the best place for the roundup because that also may include um, programs that are not funded through this. So you can sort of see, hopefully, the full array of emergency rental assistance that might be available for someone in your particular area, um, federal and not. Great, hey, Ellie, are there other questions in the pipeline? There sure are. Um, and I think, Lisa, that you, what you just talked about kind of answers this question. Um, this person was asking for some clarification on who will be administering the rental assistance. And so what you just described is, is the best way for folks to figure that out in their area, correct? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, again, to not beat a dead horse, but to give the example of California. So we have this large state program because the state got the lion's share of California's money. Uh, but then there are um, programs, you know, in um, LA and in San Francisco and in Oakland and um, lots of other local jurisdictions that got their own direct grants. And some of those are participating in the kind of state system. Some of those have their own application processes. Many of them are using, um, you know, local community-based organizations, um, either for outreach or even for intake. But uh, as you can tell, place to place, it's just going to look very different. So it's really hard to say this is where you go. And I do think the, um, from what I've seen, that that kind of database that the National Low Income Housing Coalition is is trying to, you know, keep up to date. Um, is probably the best kind of roundup um, of of everything out there as much as they can, you know, collect the information and, and get it up there quickly. Okay, so so that everybody knows when we send out the recording link, we'll we'll include the link that that Lisa is referring to, so that yeah. you can have some place to, to to take a look. Um. Yeah. So is there any word about extending the CDC moratorium? 
we ask ourselves that and ask each other that every day or at every staff meeting we have at my shop. Um, there is a lot of discussion of it. Uh, it is unclear to us exactly what the administration is planning to do. They have certainly taken a lot of input from uh, NHLP and the Low Income Housing Coalition and others. Um, but as you know, it's ending, at least as, as of today, it is scheduled to end at the end of this month, which is not very far off. I, I would say, you know, one of the exhausting things I think for all of us about the pandemic is that every single extension or additional anything seems to always come at the last moment. It's like, it, and it just creates so much stress, but that's where we are again. Um, one troubling thing that you may be seeing in the news is that there have recently been um, three different um, judicial decisions uh, with kind of different analyses in various ways, finding that the CDC moratorium is not legal or constitutional in one case. Um, the Justice Department um, is appealing at least two of those and uh, you know, has made the statement that those are limited to the parties in those cases. But another thing that we are have certainly started to see um, is landlords um, all around the country essentially, you know, going into court and saying this thing is invalid. So um, as you already know, the CDC moratorium already was kind of full of holes and um you know wasn't sort of a universal protection for everybody in every case anyway um and this has kind of poked more holes in it so we're hoping very much that the administration will take steps to um address you know whatever the legal issues are but also to strengthen um the moratorium you know, ideally, we would like to see something passed through Congress that would deal with this issue. Um, it would be a lot more straightforward, but for fairly obvious reasons, um, we're not expecting that, to sort of not holding our breaths for that. I mean, we're pushing it, and there are obviously people in Congress who are willing to do that, but there are others who are not. So. Um, it was not able to be included in this American Rescue Plan because of this complicated issue with how, how procedurally that plan was passed since it was only the Democrats who voted for it. Um, and they had to kind of work around the filibuster. Sorry, that gets into a lot of legalities. But the main thing is, for various reasons, they couldn't include it in the American Rescue Plan, even though... Uh, I think it would be obvious to all of us that it should have been a central piece of that plan to to keep people housed um, for quite a while more. Okay, uh, there was some fund allocation for emergency Section 8 vouchers. Does that mean that there will be additional funding to expand Section 8? Uh, so, yeah, there are... Um, I think it's $5 billion, and this is in addition to the, the 21.55 for the rental assistance. Um, the $5 billion, sorry, let me just pull this up, um, is for uh, both new um, vouchers and renewing um, emergency vouchers that already exist. Uh, so that money is going to flow through public housing agencies um, and um, hopefully should mean that, you know, if they were otherwise going to terminate somebody's rental assistance um, uh, for the reasons that that can happen, um, that that assistance will be extended. Um, and, you know, there's eligibility for that and allocations, but again, that's all going to be kind of administered through through the, the public housing authority um, in the particular area. Uh, if people have specific questions about those, I'm happy to answer them probably offline. You're free to email me anytime. Um, but I'm not going to go into the details. So but that that is a $5 billion additional pot and um, that assistance um, is kind of out there, I guess, for about two and a half years. It looks like when those vouchers end, they, they don't get sort of extended beyond uh, September 30th, 2023. So it's not, you know, I mean, it's 
as with many of these things, it's a temporary fix and it doesn't solve, you know, longer term, deeper affordability issues that, that folks in the community um, will continue to face. Uh, I did put Lisa's email address in the chat box for anybody that wants to reach out to her. Um, did you say that a tenant can only get 25% of their rent from this funding? I did not. So sorry if that was confusing. I was giving the example of how California has designed its program and just making the point that they have given uh, a different, um, allowed for a different amount um, to be uh, given out to somebody if it's the landlord participating or if it's the landlord doesn't participate and it's just the tenant. I don't know how it looks in other um, jurisdictions. It may be that, you know, in some places they're funding 100% of the back rent and that's whether it's the landlord or the tenant who is, you know, getting the, the funds. Um, so it's really, again, going to be dependent on where you are. Uh, but if you are in California and if it's part of a state program, that is the distinction that our legislature and governor in their unwisdom decided to make. Okay. In certain cities, various entities have been named as the entity to submit application for rental assistance. What's the criteria provided to make the selection of those particular entities that were selected? Uh, again going to be different in different places so um it will depend on probably what the legislature or the you know legislative body of a local jurisdiction has decided to do there are i don't think that there's a lot of guidance or restriction necessarily from treasury on that particular issue so we're going to see a lot of variation I am going to have to hop off in just a minute. Um, I'm happy to answer further questions if you want to send them to me by email and I will send you those links. I'm so sorry to be leaving quickly, but I'm supposed to be on another call that we're prepping for now. <laughs> so. Uh, so let me just ask then, how can landlords be helped for back rent due if the tenant's no longer living there for various reasons? So this is a question we've been asked a lot and um our understanding of the treasury guidance is that the, the tenant does still have to be occupying in order for the rental assistance to be available um, and that is because uh you know at a fundamental level the purpose of this is to keep people housed it's not um i mean it is obviously intended to you know pay the small landlords who are also struggling but um, not in all instances. So it's trying to achieve both things at once, keeping people housed and getting the rent to the landlords. Um, so as far as we know, and this could change, but our understanding now is that if somebody has already moved or left or been evicted or whatever it is, and there's back rent owed, um, that neither the landlord nor the tenant would be eligible for these particular funds um, to cover that back rent once they're out of the unit. Okay, if there's more questions, but being respectful of your time, I will email them to you and we can then send out the answers to everybody. Fabulous, and again, I, I apologize for taking off early, but thank you for, um, all your questions and, and attention, and I will uh, get back to you, Ellie, um, with that information later today. Thanks so much, Lisa. This was terrific. Very, very helpful as always. And appreciate the support you give us. Um, and, so sorry, people... We need to pivot a little bit. Um, we should go to Joseph Sant next, rather than um, in our in our agenda. We were going to go next to Casey Brownberg about unemployment insurance, but um, Joseph has. Um, has an obligation that uh, he'll need to get to, so we need to go to him next. Okay, sounds good. So Joseph Sant from the Center for New York City Neighborhoods um, and uh, talking about the um, Homeowners Assistance Fund and the Housing Counseling Funding. Joseph, welcome again. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you for accommodating the, the switch there. I appreciate that. Um, let's dive right in. I'm gonna talk about 
two pieces of the homeowner relief, uh, really important victories that were included in the American Rescue Plan. Um, one is the $100 million in housing counseling that we've mentioned a few times. And second is the 10 billion, almost $10 billion in homeowner assistance funding, uh, direct homeowner assistance funding for uh, affected households. So let's dive into the 100 million. And I wanna just give kind of a factual, uh, this is what's in the statute kind of overview. Um, as Bruce had already mentioned, some of the discussions that are already underway uh, that NHRC is creating space for around uh, how these these funds might be used. So I'll, I'll try to focus on the fundamentals. What's in the statute? What framework does it set up? And hopefully that helps set the stage for for further discussion about uh, you know big picture thinking about where it goes from here. So. This is funding uh, $100 million that is allocated uh, for housing counseling. It's available until September 30th, 2025. Um, and the funding for this program is going to flow first to NeighborWorks. It will be made available to housing counseling intermediaries, state housing finance agencies, and importantly, NeighborWorks organizations. And so this is, uh, these are the uh, entities that are going to receive uh, the housing counseling services funding here. What kinds of services will this $100 million fund? So there's a few things. Uh, one, housing counseling to households facing housing instability, including eviction, default, foreclosure, loss of income, or homelessness. So important to note there, that's home ownership counseling and renter counseling. I know we've made a lot of comparisons to this program and the predecessor, uh, national, uh, the NFMC. Uh, this is an important difference to note right off the bat where the scope includes eviction uh, and renter counseling. Uh, funding can also be used for education, outreach, training, technology upgrades and other program related support um, and that's going to be particularly important in all of those things uh, particularly outreach and uh, capacity building are a challenge right now um, that we're hearing from a lot of groups uh, you know reaching clients building up capacity to meet the the new programmatic needs and doing technology upgrades. So really glad to see all of those things um, potentially uh, as eligible usages of these funds. And then the third thing that the funds could be used for is uh, for operational oversight and for administration for the, for the grantees. So a couple more basics, at least 40% of the grant funds are going to be made to counseling organizations that either uh, one, target housing counseling services to minority and low income populations facing housing instability, or organizations that provide housing counseling services in neighborhoods that have a high concentration of minority and low income populations. So again, that's uh, an or. 40% of the funds will go to the groups that are serving the minority and low income populations or that are providing services in neighborhoods with high concentrations um, of minority and low income populations. Um, so I mentioned the predecessor of the program being the National Foreclosure Mitigation Counseling Program administered through NeighborWorks. And this funding I would say is inspired by but does not necessarily need to exactly follow in the footsteps of NFMC, which, uh, as we all know, it was operating since 2008 and to, to, through uh, a couple of years ago. And that program helped so many homeowners, really boosted the capacity around the country to provide foreclosure prevention services. Um, so again, just want to note that difference here. This program with this 100 million extends to renter-focused services as well. 
So there's a lot to determine from here on the part of NeighborWorks about how the program will roll out, um, but it is a really important time as a community to be thinking about the lessons learned from the NFMC and other housing counseling programs that have uh, come into place since 2008. And it's a time to bring those lessons into this next phase uh, as this $100 million gets programmed. And so some of the questions that I would just highlight are being thought through. Um, I want to give folks a sense of you know, what is what is the type of discussion that that we maybe should be having. So the topics range from data collection and reporting. You know, do we have thoughts on how that should work? How much capacity building support is needed at this time? Um, how might that be reflected and how funds are awarded to groups? Um, Another topic is how intensive is the casework going to be? Is it uh, what's it going to look like on the home ownership side, um, and how will that differ or be the same as what uh, as what we've seen in the past with an FMC? And what will it entail on the renter side, which is a little less developed, a little less formalized? Um, so definitely need ideas to come forward on that. Um, I mentioned as well that outreach is kind of a hot topic. It's it's really hard across the country. For a lot of groups are expressing uh, concern that that client volume is low, um, intake is down, um, partly as a result of the mor moratoria and forbearances. Um, so that's been a challenge getting in touch with clients and and what could be done as this program rolls out to address that. Um, so there are many other of these global issues and also nitty gritty kind of operational issues to sort out as a community. Um, I'll avoid wading in further on that right now, but I wanted to give this kind of factual, you know, here's what the statute says and start to suggest what the discussions ahead might need to look like and uh, would repeat Bruce's encouragement that uh, folks who have lessons to share based on their experiences since 2008, uh, you know, really want to see those ideas come forward. Um, so I'll leave it at that on the 100 million and um, look forward to the panel discussion in a moment. But first, I uh, want to talk about the other big homeowner relief provision, which is the Homeowner Assistance Fund. So the American Rescue Plan allocates 9.96 billion dollars to the homeowner assistance fund so what will this program do this is a program where funding will be provided through the department of treasury to states territories tribes and tribally designated housing entities to provide direct assistance to homeowners so dollars to homeowners this is direct relief uh, that so many of us have been calling for over the last uh, several months. And the program in concept, it's based loosely on the hardest hit funds program that operated in 18 states during the Great Recession, as well as programs that um, other states have experienced and put in place using national mortgage settlement funds. While it's based loosely on those programs, again, it doesn't necessarily need to follow exactly in the hardest hit funds programs footsteps. Um, so $10 billion, uh, I wanted to mention a couple of framing remarks about how many households this might help. Um, and this is highly speculative. So, uh, but I think it's important to get a sense of of how far these funds might go. So in the comparable hardest hit funds programs that operated in 18 other states during their recession, the average household needed $21,000 to avoid foreclosure. So per average size of the award was 21,000. And so we, when we look at this uh, crisis, we see that some homeowners might be on extended forbearance as long as, as 18 months for federally backed borrowers. So maybe they will need comparably sized awards. And if they do, if homeowners need assistance in the range of that twenty to $30,000 per household, this fund could help between 400,000 and 500,000 families avoid losing their homes. So that is a 
tremendous amount of homes saved and uh, great outcomes for communities. But I did want to pause for a moment and consider there are 2.6 million homeowners in extended forbearance right now. So $10 billion is a lot. Saving half a million homes is incredible. But uh, the 10 billion isn't enough to just sort of take all of the take all of the arrears that people have accrued and just pay them down. And the point of that, the point of saying that is to just to reemphasize how important the loss mitigation process is still going to be. Um, the fact that we have this 10 billion doesn't make the loss mitigation, uh, the post forbearance loan workouts that people are gonna need to access, doesn't make those any less important. And it's gonna be really critical to integrate this fund with uh, and think about how it works in tandem with loss mitigation. So it's great that we have this tool. Uh, it's one of many tools we need to prevent the loss of homes. Um, so I, I want to talk about the purpose of the fund because that will give us a sense of you know who is going to be helped and what will the fund pay for. And I'll just read out the purpose to you um, and I'll note there's also a fact sheet that we put out uh, yesterday, and I think it's linked in the, the webinar uh, tool panel. So if you want to reference this later, you can. But I'll, I'll say it here. The purpose is to prevent homeowner mortgage delinquencies, defaults, foreclosures, loss of utilities or home energy services, and displacements of homeowners experiencing financial hardship after January 21st, 2020. And uh, so, so let's unpack that a little bit. We're talking about preventing uh, mortgage delinquencies, but, but we're going beyond that. The fund's purpose is to prevent the loss of homes that might occur from a broad range of threats. That includes mortgage delinquencies, but it could also include loss of utilities, home energy services, um, and we hope uh, that Treasury will also decide this covers tax delinquencies. Um, so it's an important recognition. There are many uh, threats to home ownership right now uh, on top of mortgage delinquency. Second thing to highlight, I, I mentioned the purpose is to, to help homeowners experiencing a financial hardship after January 21st, 2020. Now, does that mean if the hardship started before that date that the homeowner doesn't qualify? We think not. And we are urging Treasury to adopt an interpretation uh, accordingly. We think it's really important to recognize that homeowners might have been experiencing a hardship before that date, and the pandemic could have made it much worse. Uh, and so if you had a hardship before that date, the pandemic hit, you couldn't obtain employment, you continue to have a reduction of income. That's the type of person this fund should be helping. And so we're making that case to Treasury that, that, that we hope they will interpret that requirement flexibly. Uh, and then uh, the next part of the, the statute that I want to go over is what are the qualified usages that these funds can be used for? What can they pay for? Um, so I'll read off the list. And again, I'll, uh, I'll just note this information is in the fact sheet that we have circulated. So Feel free to reference it later. But the fund usages include mortgage payments or arrears, facilitating a loan modification, utilities, internet service, insurance, and that includes homeowners, flood, uh, and, and mortgage insurance, HOA, condo fees, common charges. So a broad range of things can be uh, paid for using these funds. Um, I will note there's also a general catch-all in qualified usages where the funds can be used for, quote, any other assistance to promote housing stability, end quote. We don't know what that means yet. It will be up to Treasury to define that, but um, just want to flag that there is this sort of general, general uh, in case we missed anything type of language that is in the statute. Um, and, and we hope uh, to get a, a beneficial interpretation from Treasury on that. So uh, I'll mention targeting. 
who's going to get these funds? Um, the statute requires that at least 60% of funds go to households who are at or below 100% of, of area median income. What about the remaining funds? So the remaining funds, what the statute says, is that they need to be prioritized to socially disadvantaged populations. That term is not defined in the statute, socially disadvantaged, but there are some helpful precedents that we might look at. Uh, and what this, what this language is intended to do is make sure that the funds get to the hardest hit communities, including borrowers of color, homeowners of color, who are experiencing the effects of the pandemic really disproportionately. And so we're, we're also, uh, a group of us have been urging Treasury to provide, uh, to interpret this language in a way that makes sure as much funding from this program flows to those communities. And the last thing I'll, I'll walk us through is what happens next and how do we take this funding and turn it into a program that people can actually apply to? And when will that happen? So now that Congress has passed this statute, there's a lot left to do and determine in the weeks ahead. Uh, the statute gives a broad framework, which I've just outlined. It leaves a lot of discretion to Treasury to give guidance about how, in more specific terms, this program is going to look. So the Treasury is responsible for administering the program. The next thing that will happen is Treasury will need to start dispersing funds from the Homeowner Assistance Fund to states within 45 days uh, to states and eligible entities. It doesn't say all funding has to be good, be out the door by the 45th day, just within 45 days of enactment, Treasury has to start making payments. So date of enactment was March 11th and we got 45 days before Treasury was required to start distributing. And so we expect that before that, Treasury is gonna uh, issue some guidance. What might that guidance contain? If we look at what Treasury's done in comparable programs like the Emergency Rental Assistance Program that, that Lisa was uh, walking us through. We might expect Treasury's guidance to talk about who's eligible and how do they document that eligibility. Um, we might expect that guidance to cover reporting. You know, what does the state need, what data does the state need to collect about who's being served and how does that data then become transparently shared with the public. That Those questions fall to Treasury as well, um, and they're very important questions, uh, especially so we can determine whether or not these funds are going to the populations that they ought to be helping. So Treasury, there's a lot more that Treasury could do. We aren't sure yet how specific or how general Treasury will be. We are definitely urging Treasury to be as specific as possible about what this program should look like and to make it as flexible and easy to access for homeowners as possible. Um, and then once Treasury issues that guidance and just starts dispersing funds to the states, it's then up to the states to, to, to stand up programs and open up applications uh, so that homeowners can actually apply. Uh, and one thing we're really urging throughout this process is that both Treasury and the states do as much as they can to integrate local nonprofit services into this program and to the delivery of this program. We would really like to see housing counselors, legal services providers being the intake for this program, conducting the outreach. And that's one of the most effective ways we think that you can make sure that this fund will go to the populations that need it. And at the same time, have homeowners applying for the best possible loss mitigation from the servicer. Because again, the $10 billion will go far, it won't cure all arrears. So we, we need both this fund and loss mitigation to avoid unnecessary loss of homes. So I think that's all I'm gonna uh, uh, have time for today and I'll, I'll stop there and I'm looking forward to to your questions and then the rest of the discuss, dis, the discussion. But again, one more plug, please look at the fact sheet, 
uh, if you have questions, uh, and it'll recap a lot of what I just went over. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much, Joseph. That's very helpful. Um, and uh, I mean, this is uh, exactly where we need to be. And Joseph and um, uh, the National Consumer Law Center and many advocates and at POSAS have been working, have, have put together proposals for the, uh, um, the Treasury to have a streamlined application. Um, uh, this idea that Joseph talked about, about um, can, can housing counseling agencies that do the actual intake, um, can legal services do intake? Um, those are really um, recipes for success in all this. Um, also gives you opportunity to work with clients and, and help um, um, connect with the servicer and hopefully have a, a package solution that, that includes both the subsidy and, and a loss mitigation option. Um, so lots of opportunity here to do what we can do best if we can get positioned well, um, but we'll see what, what uh, Treasury chooses to adopt here. So we're going to keep rolling here because there's a little bit more we want to cover and then we want to spend some time really on the, on the how, do you, how do you put it out into the field. Um, so the next piece is on unemployment insurance, and I'm glad to say we have Casey Bromberg back from Northeast Strategies, um, who has um, deep ex experience in unemployment insurance. So there's a whole provision in the um, American Rescue Act on unemployment, obviously a critical thing for our borrowers and making sure that people actually um, have applied and can access it successfully. Casey, welcome back. Thank you. Um, I'll keep it quick because I know we have other presenters that have a lot more um, substantive conversations. And this is pretty straightforward. So Ellie, if you can switch on. So we're gonna talk about the components, what it means for clients, who's eligible, and then how to escalate claims for help when there's problems with the unemployment system. So what we got out of the uh, American Rescue Plan was $300 per week in just the pandemic unemployment assistance. So that's the PUA and the PEUAC. Um, assistance. They also are going to exempt $10,200 of an unemployment benefits from the 2020 taxes. So let's talk about each of those individually. All eligible individuals will continue to receive an average weekly benefit. So they get their base unemployment and then they're going to get that $300 in addition to that average weekly benefit. If someone is unemployed outside of the pandemic circumstances, so when they apply for unemployment, there's a box they check that says, were you unemployed because of the pandemic? If they don't check that box, they may not receive that extra $300. They may just get the normal average weekly benefit. So it has to be pandemic related for them to get the $300. Now, the next piece of it, the taxation, a lot of people don't realize that, if you can go to the next slide, Ellie, um, a lot of people don't realize that tax, that unemployment benefits are considered federally and state taxable income. So all claimants have the right to withhold taxes from benefits. However, usually at the end of the claim, they have the option to withhold those taxes when they first um, do their initial claim but most claimants are looking for the maximum benefit, so they choose not to, or they don't understand the option. Just like with a lot of things that we run into in housing counseling, the claimants don't always understand what's going on when they see that box about taxation, they don't know what to check. So for 2020, claimants can now exempt $10,200 of the unemployment benefits they've already received. So if claimants have already filed their taxes, they should see a tax professional to talk about considering amending the filing. Um, if they have not, the tax um, deadline has been extended to May 17th. Um, and some states are also considering changing their laws to be consistent with the federal law to retroactively support um, the PUA claimants. 
And this is the, um, if you can go to the next slide, Ellie. Um, this is gonna be for anyone who is eligible for unemployment. So every state authorizes it a little bit differently, but typically it's someone who's been working a wage earning job. So they have wages in the system, they're a W-2 employee. Self-employment is kind of like the monkey in the middle. Unless there's a pandemic connection, it may or may not apply. Because, so if you're just a normal sole, sole proprietor, you may not get any pandemic assistance because you don't qualify for PPP and you don't qualify for unemployment because you don't have any wages in the system. So some states are working with that, some states are not. It's definitely something that you're gonna wanna ask about if you run into somebody with self-employment who has a pandemic connection, we should definitely reach out to your labor department um, and see what we can do for them. So all of this has been extended through September 6th, the week ending September 6, 2021, um, with that $300 benefit. And if you can go to the last slide, Ellie, we'll, or the next to last slide, if you're having trouble with claims, always start with the general 800 number. So if someone's not getting their, their PUA benefits, um, work with the general contacts to start and document your attempts. Um, and it should, be, it be, should be coming from the claimant primarily, but I know sometimes we have claimants that can't do this on their own. Um, so make sure that you have a TPA, a third party authorization, that says here it's okay for you to talk to unemployment for them. If you don't get the response back, start working the channels. Start with the governor's office, the labor commissioner's office, the division director for UI, or a state legislator. All of them have back doors into the UI division director's office in most states that escalate constituent claims. So they can work the channels much faster than just continuing to contact the general 800 number, but you have to start that way in order to make it work. So that's really what I had. Um, I will stay on for questions, but I'm more of a process person than a policy person. I'll just tell you that much. Um, and we'll see what we can do for people. Um, well, thank you. Uh, let me just ask quickly. Um, I thought that the um, I thought that the unemployment um, uh, covered gig workers, so self-employed. And you're saying sometimes that sometimes it does, state? sometimes it doesn't. It really depends so it wasn't... on their wages and how they're determined. Is there, can you say one more sentence about that so we kind of understand what we're talking about? Um, sure. Um, it really depends on how their wages are reported. So if those gigs are W-2 gigs, they're more likely to get unemployment. If they're 1099s, they may have a little more trouble with that process. Wow. Well, I mean, they're likely to be 1099s. That's the thing. They're the monkey in the middle. So, um, great. Uh, this is actually very helpful. I think it's escalating claims piece, um, which you, I think, talked on the last call about. Just want to really emphasize that with people that um, often these people, a state legislature, they do the budget for the um, uh, for the um, unemployment department. They have a different relationship than um, uh, the rest of us do and, and um, have these backdoor channels are important to use once you've gone through the regular cycle. And, and that may be the way we can break through on the um, bureaucracy so that you don't get people spinning wheels. But uh, thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to add um, 
just uh, really on the agenda, but just so you're thinking about it um, uh, on the kind of benefits that are available through the American uh, Rescue Act. Another one that isn't available immediately, but will uh, should be around this summer is the um, uh, child tax credit. And, um, and this is only for a year, as I understand it, but it, it increases the child tax credit uh, to $3,000 and for a child under six, uh, $3,600. So it's each child, but it also does something very important, which is it takes those dollars and if you haven't made enough money, it, it acts it, you will get it, um, um, you'll get a, a payment um, as opposed to having it written up on your taxes. And the IRS is supposed to structure this so that this can become a monthly supplemental payment to families. Um, and where this might be important for us, one is it's a key way that families can get um, new income badly needed. Um, and it's, um, uh, and it'll be targeted to income, but the critical issue here is that it's available, um, uh, it could be available for people who wouldn't necessarily have, um, uh, uh, wouldn't be, able, who don't have enough money to really take advantage of the credit, so that it's, um, um, we want to make sure that very low income families actually access this and, and, uh, Get uh, get to, be, to take advantage of it once it's available. So, um, kind of a critical, useful thing, and I think it's also a profound um, social policy that could be really helpful for families across America. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure that it actually works for people who are the most in need. Um, there'll be more about this as it rolls out, and it won't be available, I believe, until July. Um, and we'll certainly have more information at the point that it moves, but worth keeping your eye out for it. Good. So with that note, let's move on to um, uh, our, our panel. And we're going to start with um, Lou Tisler from the National Neighbor Works Association, who has, um, all of our people have high experience in, in uh, uh, NFMC and hardest hit. So Lou, why don't you give us some thoughts about what counseling agencies should be thinking about and, and preparing for this uh, uh, moving forward. Sure. Um, can you hear me okay, Bruce? Yes, perfectly. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, you know, in terms of talking about um, the $100 million program and how it's going to mirror NFMC, the first thing that I really want to bring to people's attention is that for NFMC, it had to be delivered by a HUD approved counseling agency. And with August 1st coming soon, I think that everybody needs to redouble their efforts to make sure that all their housing counselors become certified uh, by August 1st, uh, because I don't know what the implications would be to this, and perhaps Bruce or my other panelists can mention something, but I do believe that it could be adversely affected for you to be able to receive payment. Um, also, in terms of uh, networks America organizations to participate, like NFMC, there's a, uh, a limit or a governor of 15% of the total funding um, to Neighborhoods America. So that would mean um, technically that other intermediaries would be able to, uh, to receive more than 15%. I doubt if that'll be the case um, due to the numerous intermediaries. Um, but at times people have said, you know, well, Neighborhoods America organizations will be able to really soak up all this funding. but as in NFMC, there is a 15% um, cap. And during the 10 years of NFMC, uh, neighborhoods organizations did not get to that cap. Uh, very close, but never did. Um, what I really want to talk about is um, the, the ability uh, to be able to access those funds. Um, and you know, in terms of the last uh, leaders call, and if you're on the call and uh, not a member, uh, the uh, National Housing Resource Center, I would really implore you to, to join and to renew uh, because it's well worth uh, the, the price of admission. Um, you're able to get the insights here um, and be able to 
do input in terms of putting the program together. And so we'll see the rollout uh, as uh, NFMC, I believe, uh, in terms of there being an advance. Uh, we are really hoping to push for that. And I would think that uh, NeighborWorks knows the importance of being able to, to have an advance, uh, to be able to look to programmatic funding uh, expenses uh, for that recovery. Um, but we all know that $100 million over three years is not enough. Um, and so it, it's three years as compared to NFMC that was one year and then kept going back. And you know the appropriator said, this, is a, this was supposed to be a one year deal and now it's gone for eight years, nine years, 10 years. Um, and so I think that um, in terms of the efforts that are looking to bring significantly more funding uh, to the table for this is really, really important. And so, um, you know, first off, I would really go and make sure that counselors are certified and ready to go. There's a ton of resources out there to get them across the finish line, but you want to make sure that you don't lose uh, continuity and access to that funding. Um, and I think that it's imperative that we all continue to share uh, once it does get um, put into place on uh, what things need to be changed, or what things are good, uh, and continue to relay those to, to Neighborhoods America. Is that good, Bruce? So, yeah, Lou, um, why don't I just uh, ping you a little bit on um, uh, the uh, hardest hit funds in Ohio sure. were they actually had housing counseling agencies doing this work, yep. um, doing the subcontract. So can you just walk us through a little bit of what that looked like? And is that a model that other um, uh, agencies might want to approach their states about? Sure. I really think that the Ohio Housing Finance Agency was in front of the curve in terms of uh, promoting housing counseling, uh, giving access to funding to housing counseling agencies. Um, in, in really making it happen. And so just in terms of when they developed the HHF program, I'm just gonna go through what the funding was. Uh, and this was in 2010 for the, the program year 2011. So the most that organizations could receive was $1,000 per client. 150 of that was for intake and triage, but without uh, submitting an application uh, for hardest hit funds. Uh, there was $200 for intake and triage with uh, submitting that application. And so uh, as you go down the path, you have access to additional funding. $500 for application approval. Uh, and so the quicker that you could, that counselors could really put together a package and have everything in place and submit it to the HFA to get the application approved, that's when a bulk of that funding really came through was the $500. And then once the assistance was provided, uh, the counseling agency received another $300. Um, now, there was a lot of tracking that counseling agencies needed to do. It was automatic through HHF, but like your checkbook, you want to reconcile that uh, in terms of the funds coming through. Uh, but I think that it is a model that could be used for other HFAs, uh, successful, and continue to build a really good bond with the counseling agencies and the HFAs uh, in terms of moving things forward. Good. So please keep that in mind. Excellent. Thank you, Lou. So Lot. So Lot Diaz um, is um, Unido, is a vice president at Unidos US and um, one of our leading thinkers in our field um, and has been on his call a number of times. Um, Lot, um, why don't you give us what you're, what you're thinking and, and how you're preparing your groups? Sure, uh, Bruce, is my, am I coming through okay? Yes, perfectly. Good. Hi, everyone. Um, pleasure to talk with you. A um, couple points, I've got kind of three points I want to make. One on, want to start with one additional element to the rescue plan that hasn't been mentioned, but I think it's critical. Uh, so the, that bill extended the, four, uh, the 1400 direct payments for, for adults and additional $1,400 for dependents. Um, but in this relief bill versus the previous one, all spouses and children with social security numbers in mixed status households were eligible. Uh, which, you know, so in our, many of the communities we serve, mixed status is a fairly common 
uh, element in a high school household. So it was critical win for uh, for our, we thought it was critical win for this bill. And that has meant 2.2 million more children will receive cash payments under the bill than allowed in the last December bill that, you know, the kind of the down payment bill that was passed. So it was a big, just important thing to remember if, as you're dealing with clients. Um, I'm gonna start with um, kind of the, the funding uh, uh, 100 million that Lou was talking about, but just keep in mind um, for HUD, um, there's like, there's kind of, because of the way the money was provided, the last year's money is just now starting to go out. Um, there's gonna be a new NOFO coming up with her, which was 53 and change. And there's a new one this year that's 50, 57 million and change. Uh, there's a push as Bruce mentioned for 100 million for the next fiscal year. And then uh, as Lou was talking about the 100 million um, that will go through NeighborWorks. That's a fair, quite a bit of funding that's out there, right? And so um, I, I, it, it's more than we've had in quite a while. Um, and so one of the key things that both the, um, you know, kind of internal intermediary kind of policymakers about, is there, can, will we be able to serve enough families to, um, to uh, pay to, you know, kind of spend all that money? Um, most of us are believe we know the demands out there and uh, we need to do that. But one of the critical staff that all agencies are gonna uh, will be facing is throwing their counseling staff to kind of meet demand. And I'll talk a little bit about the demand below, but just before, I, just a snippet, I know we're gonna, this is gonna be a topic going forward, but two elements that, I, that we're focused on. One is, we want to get award information out to agencies as soon as we can, and we're going to encourage our partners to do the same, because it one of the key things that agencies need to do they need to plan, right? And they have to plan based on resources, and if we're not sure about the resources, it slows down the planning, et cetera, et cetera. So we want to kind of change that dynamic to the degree possible, and with all of you know, with HUD, that can be a challenge. Um, so that's the first point. But the second point, which is a, is also we have to remember how we grow staff and that we, you particularly now in the new rules of HUD certification. Uh, so I just wanted to put, uh, mention three points, right? Um, many, most of you, are, if you hire new counselors, they're not gonna be certified, um, at least not pass the test. Maybe uh, that could happen we're not anticipating, you're gonna have to grow counseling staff to to large degree. And so um, key elements in that, uh, they're going to have to play roles in your program um, and, as intakes, other roles, and you have to. We have to figure out a way to build that to the HUD goal. Uh, we're thinking about that a lot now. Um, you know, you have to pass the certification test for sure. But remember that the national industry standards also apply with many, many funders, big banks, states, uh, who are who want counseling agencies to meet the national industry standards. And the national industry standards are requirements of 30 hours of approved training, um, and that's for generally speaking is the pre, uh, you know, the pre-purchase foreclosure training. And you know, usually in our groups we had the financial counseling to get the 30 hours, and then um, the agency and not the counselor. This is a bit there's a confusion on this. Has to have counseled 30 clients that year or had six months. Uh, uh, employment in the counseling agency. Now that's not necessarily the new counselor, is that on your counseling staff, but that's a key distinction to make as you think about growing these, uh, growing your counseling staff. And then lastly on that is every three years, you have to have 30 hours of, of ongoing continuing education. So I guess that we talk about it a lot in our agency, in our network, and I just wanted to kind of ra you know, raise those issues for you. Uh, the last two points I make is around the roles on rental counseling and foreclosure counseling. Uh, firstly, rental counseling is going to be is we've talked about uh, with the new not only with the new rental assistance program, but there's many landlords and folks who are not um, uh, who are not necessarily following rules they should. Um, each uh, and if you start with that, you know the what do what do uh, having uh, someone who can advocate for that client with the landlord um, in these kinds of con conditions, who knows the law, 
is going to be a big, uh, could help a, a lot of renters maintain their housing. Um, and so in our network, we've been encouraging more people to kind of develop that skill. We've been offering trainings on that skill. Um, and um, so we, we encourage that. But at minimum, even if you don't, if your agency does not offer it, uh, highly encourage you to find a sister agency that can be your go-to reference for those clients because, um, you know, as foreclosure is bad as well, but, you know, kind of being left out there with no support, with no access to information is, we're trying to avoid that in the rental world. So, um, you know, we're trying to expand that work and we're hoping others do as well. Uh, and then the last thing I would say about the uh, rental assistance program, National Low Income Housing Coalition uh, is really the kind of the go-to agency on this stuff. And a couple points I wanted to mention, uh, some of them been mentioned here that, you know, they did a great survey uh, of, of programs nationally, kind of trying to get the lay of the land for the new rental assistance programs. And they asked kind of what are the biggest challenges, right? And not surprising, face designing and implementing the programs um, are a big, big problem because it's there, it's a it's a large problem, and knowing how to actually address it can be difficult. Um, but the two most common limitations they cited for it, you know, having a good program was completeness of applications and the staff capacity to process these applications, right? So, um, and both of those areas, um, you know, we can't be their staff, but housing counseling can be an extension of their staff capacity in some ways. And in fact, uh, National Low Income Housing Coalition noted that, um, that programs that used community resources like counseling organization were much more effective in enabling tenants access, access assistance. So earlier points have made, who's gonna be providing your program locally, et cetera, et cetera, is really kind of getting um, aware of those resources and connecting with them and just make sure you understand the flow that can uh, that clients, uh, that a, a, a renter would have to go to get that assistance. So I wanna just uh, end that with the rental. And on lastly, on the foreclosure, um, Ex exiting forbearance is going to be tricky. I mean, I, you talk to industry folks there, nobody's exactly sure what's going to happen. And in fact, some are saying foreclosure won't be that big because they're going to sell uh, uh, those services, those those the mortgage will be sold uh, way before the foreclosure happens, or the focus will be, you know, deed in lieu um, uh, or some kind of other exit. But either way, um, there, it's so there's a lot of unknowns, and and so having people in the field who can guide guide families through that is going to be really critical. Um, uh, the you, you, I don't need to tell you, but communication um, and and the programs of servicers are highly variable. How they transact them, how they work with them. So um, you know, it, it, counseling organizations play that critical role of bridging complexity of maintaining mortgage payments and or programs and this, the talk that uh, servicers want like to hear. Um, I think what's really gonna be critical, particularly now that we have a new CFPB is reporting bad players on the portal is gonna be critical. There's, they're more likely to do enforcement now with the new leadership there. And I think it'll, it's really important for us as a, in, seeing the industry and in, go, you know, come, uh, evolve, evolve in front of our very eyes to make sure we let the CFPB know that that's, that's going to occur. And then lastly on this uh, is that the evolving modifications around this is, is I mean, there's the standard, there's a HAMP, FHA, there's the streamlined mod, uh, conventional, couple variants in, in addition, but there, there could be some uh, evolution around the modification options. And so, uh, uh, you know how information travels slowly. And so, uh, staying abreast of those, but also, you know, being able to support your clients on that is going to be a critical role in this, particularly uh, post June when the um, uh, forbearance periods are likely to end. Uh, and then, lastly, I would just say um, I've noticed is that servicers may be looking for partners, right? Because they know um, they they don't always connect with the family in the right way. Uh, or or don't have the same, you know, their, their MO is like, oh, he wants my money. So they're, they don't respond as quickly. Um, so I would look out for that. And if your agency has an opportunity to join a partnership like that, 
highly encourage it. Your intermediary may have that option as well. Um, and in other words, they can parlay in a relationship where um, they can make that happen. Um, I would look out for those because I, I noticed lenders, they remember the last crisis and um, outreach and connection with, uh, with uh, hard to serve, hard to contact borrowers was a, one of the big pluses they saw happen. And so, um, you know, look out for those um, and or if you hear of those, I would be shy of participating because the, the advantage of serving those is that you're, you're going to know the panoply of outcomes that they're, that family's going to face when they when they come to you. So um, lots of important work ahead. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think it's both an exciting time, but it's it's going to put some strains on our system and we we have to be, uh, you know, very alert to how we have to maneuver in this new environment. Um, that's all I have, Bruce. Well, excellent. No, I think um, all those things are, are right on. And um, and I will say that, um, uh, that I, mean, I think we th this is an opportunity to create more opportunity with um, uh, um, servicers and, and, and hopefully more productive relationships in, in, during this crisis. That's, very helpful. We will certainly do updates and, um, and get servicers and providers on our calls as the as the forbearance piece um, rolls out, and and there are more um, more models of how to what do the um, exit well, and we will follow up on that. And then um, uh, and I think an area that uh, Bob touched on that we um, are concerned about as well is that. Um, we understand that for people, an exit strategy because you have equity in your house might be to sell or to um, uh, do a deed in lieu. Uh, we um, the, the problem is is that, that this is also a, a path for losing some of the um, ground we have on on home ownership, especially in communities of color too. So wanting to try to make sure that the kind of funds that are available can keep a people in a house, even if um, a sale, it would be a, um, more in the interest of the um, servicer. So we want to, it's an area that, it's an area of policy and concern about um, losing ground on the, on the black and brown home ownership in this country. So definitely glad that that got elevated. Let's quickly jump over to Carrie Harris um, from DNE. Uh, and DNE is based in Atlanta, but does work in um, uh, some of the uh, um, uh, uh, in, 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 in uh, adjoining states and yes, this is the rural work. So, Carrie, welcome and uh, thank you for giving us your insight. Thank you, thank you, Bruce. Hello, everyone. I know the hour has grown late, so I won't belabor the time because a lot of what I thought and a lot of things I wanted to share has already been stated. But it is a pleasure to be on this leaders call today with Lou and Lot as panelists and. Um, all of the dynamic speakers that have spoken today and shared great information. Thank you, Bruce and Ellie, for allowing me to join in with them. Just a couple of things. My thoughts were an exact replica of what Joseph expressed and what he highlighted in his presentation and in Ellie's correspondence on March the 11th. Those were a lot of the things that I wanted to share today, and that information has already been uh, spoken of or disseminated. But what I would like to say, add to that, in hopes for consideration, would be that we are paid for our time in addition to just submission. Kind of like how the PAR works where as much time as we spend with clients, we can factor that into um, our billing process with $100 million. Because all of our clients are at different levels and different phases and it's going to take case management is going to be look, will look differently for each family or individual. So I hope that at some point we can take into consideration how we serve our clients and how that can be a billable item. And then secondly, I would like to see if we could figure out a strategic approach to integrate not-for-profits into the intake and outreach process. Because reaching the populations that are in greatest need that are harder to serve black and brown communities, I think it's gonna be critical. We are the trusted intermediaries in, within our communities and we're the folks that uh, the agency, not-for-profit not agencies the, will be the entities that um, homeowners and renters will be calling so we can figure out some way to be integrated into that intake and outreach process. I think that would be a great opportunity. And as Lot stated, I was thinking that exact same thing 
as to how we can get some of our mom and pop landlords and tenants connected either through training or some way to express to them uh, processes or a program to help them navigate through and getting some of the money that's going to be available through uh, the various funds that are offered. So that's kind of my thoughts. And everyone else has just said pretty much what was on my mind. And when it comes to the submission piece, because uh, like with NFMC is reimbursable, but as counseling agencies, all of the work goes in. If you think of a funnel and get that image in your mind, all of the work goes in at the very front, at the very beginning of the activity, the intake, the verification of the documentation, all of the real work goes in at the very beginning. And then it funnels down through to the funding. But we have ex expended so much time, paid our staff. So if we could have money, and I know capacity building was one of the items expressed in, in Ellie's document. If we could have money allocated on the front end, upfront money to assist in um, the outreach, to assist with the intake, to assist with the capacity building and everything that goes into the top of that funnel, I think it will be tremendous and will be a, a great asset in helping uh, not-for-profits come back with their inf infrastructure, build capacity and grow the agency and meet the uh, overwhelming needs that we're gonna be confronted with, with this unprecedented pandemic. So I just think it's a great opportunity as Thanks. we said, we're mission driven. I think it will be a great opportunity for us to do our mission, to fund our agencies and to do good and do well for all of the markets and communities that we serve. Thank you. Excellent, Carrie. And um, NFMC uh, uh, NeighborWorks did um, have a capacity building advance on funds and we'll certainly ask for a similar thing, but I know they're thinking about it already. So Ellie, do you wanna squeeze in a few questions here? Yeah, so uh, one of the questions that this came from a couple of different people, what if um, the counseling agency is in an area where there aren't really any intermediaries that serve them and they aren't a neighbor works organization? So I know, I mean, so I know, you know, Ohio, there was uh, some of that and it flowed because NFMC also went to HFAs, so different than the hardest hit funds, uh, but went to HFAs and they distributed as if they were an intermediary uh, to nonprofits in their community. So, um, so that's a possibility. Okay. Um, what if an organization only is offering pre-purchase counseling? So um, your HUD housing counseling grants could be covered that there, but um, it actually pre-purchase is not included in the COVID-19 funding in this bill. Okay, um, so somebody is saying, so if an agency is in a, a rural area that is not as diverse as other areas, does that mean that they won't get funding? I think there's there's some capacity to do this. It's um, uh, the, the targeting is actually for forty percent. Um, typically, our um, um, uh, if you look at the ninety nine oh two data, um, typically sixty to seventy percent of the clients that come through our doors or the counseling sessions provided um, are for people of color, and typically about two thirds of the clients are people who make less than eighty percent. So it does, you know, there is some place in there if you're providing a, um, a, a suburban middle income service, there's some place for that. And, um, and some of this will have to do with what NeighborWorks targeting is, but um, certainly in the legislation, there's some room to do that. Is there going to be a, a restart of HAMP or Hope Longport? Um, I, I don't think so. Um, the, uh, I know that there was an effort to, to get it going um, uh, more than a year ago, um, and uh, there was less um, uh, servicer uptake on it. A number of servicers have started allowing um, uh, intakes electronically uh, through their websites, and it, um, uh, you know, we'll we'll have to see where things evolve in terms of what the documentation requirements are. 
um, but we're not seeing a, um, um, Hope Loan Port as a as a vehicle right now. Um, certainly, if it does surface or some other vehicle does, we will circulate that widely. So, Bruce, a, a different question, if you don't mind. Yeah, uh, sure. I saw that you know the hawk went down um, in the previous administrations, and you know because of where Congress was. Is there any discussion of bringing that back? in terms of homeownerships armed with knowledge? Oh, yeah, so um, there's a Financial Literacy Act of 2020, which actually passed the House, um, was one strategy on this. So it was aimed at specifically at FHA mortgages and provide a quarter point discount if you um, um, uh, went to a HUD approved housing counseling agency. Um, and you know we'll try to revive that again. Um, and you know, there's, and it, we certainly can talk to HUD, and it's one of the things we will, in, in the, um, when we address the administration about thinking about what what an equivalent might look like that might um, encourage people to go to counseling. And I think what's valuable about what the financial literacy thing is is, is to get people in early in the process into the um, um, into housing counseling. Thanks. Are reverse mortgages eligible for the HAF funds? Um, Joseph, do you have a quick answer on that? Oh, we might have lost Joseph. I think they are, but let's 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 make sure. Let's confirm that. Okay. Um, somebody asked about the child tax credit. Do people who file before the new bill still get the other half of the credit? The other half of the credit. I'm not sure what that means. Okay. Um, somebody's asking about what membership they should renew. I think they're referring to what you talked about, Lou. So. Uh, that was in reference to being a member of NHRC. And if you are interested in becoming a member, you can reach out to Bruce and myself and we'll get you the information. And I'll make a plug at the end of the call. Um, do we have a room for a couple more, Ellie? Yeah, let's see. Um, how will agencies who are for whom NeighborWorks is not their intermediary access the funds. Specifically, Florida Housing distributed the NFMC funding, but they were dropped from the program, and that was the end of NFMC funding for the agencies that work via Florida Housing. Okay, so we're talking here specifically about the, um, the hardest hit, uh, I'm sorry, the Homeowners Assistance Fund. Um, so, I mean, what will happen is that states will have to ask for the money, and if it's a state that doesn't ask for the money, um, then it could potentially go to other states, but we hope and expect that all of them will, um, and they will distribute the funds. And um, so um, the Hardest Hit Fund was um, a more targeted program, and um, uh, and not every state was eligible. Florida absolutely was, um, but it was more. We're, we would like it to be a less state-driven, more treasury guidance, and this is how the funds flow. That's really what, to me, was the most important part. Though there's some very important things in, in what the advocates are advocating to treasury, and they've certainly heard this. I mean, we had very senior people in the, in the, the one conversation we've had with them. Um, uh, we'll, we'll see what they ended up designing, but um, part of what we are concerned about is Florida was a really good example. They would have a 97% rejection rate on people applying in, in, a, in, in a state where they had foreclosure rates through the roof. It was just exasperating. Um, so the idea was to make this very simple and um, not put in the, the many barriers to kind of target how the funds go out, but instead really try to get the funds out. Um, and um, and to, to Joseph's point earlier, um, we will certainly, and there's many others who will advocate for, for more funding um, in the uh, uh, for another round of funding for uh, to replenish the housing assistance fund this summer, and hopefully that will be 
it'll be more than the $10 billion. And I would just say that if it was due to NFMC, and so um, that was pulled, and the only reason they would pull it is for some very specific reason, they would probably have to show that, um, you know, that they've remediated whatever that reason was. And again, you know, when we delineate between NeighborWorks America and HUD intermediaries, NeighborWorks America is a HUD intermediary. Um, and so it's not as if it's HUD intermediaries and NeighborWorks America. NeighborWorks America organizations are the only ones that are operating under that 15% uh, maximum. So, you know, it, it's all the, all the other intermediaries um, that are out there. And if you're not part of that, then going through the HFA, but the HFA has done something to disqualify themselves previously, they'll have to show that that's been remediated, uh, I would think, in terms of being able to accept the funds again. Okay, I'm aware that we're, um, we've, we've crossed the second hour. So um, I think what we'll do is, is wind down the call um, so that uh, um, we can let people go. Um, I know that we're, uh, so I, let's do that. And I'm gonna just quickly um, make a plug for um, if uh, you haven't already joined NHRC, please go ahead and do it. Um, you can find our membership application on our website, um, hsgcenter.org, www.hsgcenter.org. You can also just sign up for our leaders and housing counseling list, and that's open to any um, housing counseling agency or organization that's deeply involved with housing counseling. Um, and the um, uh, uh, but, but we do restrict who, who gets in, so please go through the process and we'll, um, um, uh, we'll we regularly check to make sure that people get in. Um, but then the membership application is there, or you can certainly email us. Um, there are benefits. Um, uh, you can get a discount on your credit reports um, through CoreLogic Credco. Um, and there's also the online student loan service savvy, which is terrific and want to encourage groups to use it. There's plenty of free stuff on it that is very good for you, your clients, and your staff. Um, and then if you want them to handle the service, um, we have a deep discount on getting it there. And there's plenty of room for other groups to use this and, and um, take advantage of it. But uh, um, there's, uh, I want to encourage, uh, I was surprised that, there, that not as many are using it as, as can, and you know, it's a very, very useful set of tools. So, the people who put it together from the CFPB originally, um, I think it's a really good idea, good example of a well-run social enterprise that's helpful for our work. Um, but, you know, your housing counseling uh, membership uh, in NHRC also means that you're supporting our work and the, our ability to do the lobbying that will help both bring better programming, we think, and um, um, increased funding. And uh, it's really helpful to us. And we appreciate that uh, groups have, have really um, gone out of their way to be members. Um, I think we're up to about 170, 180 organizations that are members, but there's room for more if, if you haven't joined. And thanks to all the groups that have already renewed for 2021. And with that note, we're going to close out. We'll make an announcement about when the next um, uh, meeting is. We are going to time these meetings. We, we'll, we'll, we'll really try to keep the Thursday, um, 1 o'clock Eastern time frame. Um, but we do want to time these meetings um, uh, to sort of meet the needs and opportunities of, uh, as things are moving forward. Um, you know, so we'll we try to do it the first and third um, uh, Thursday of the month. But you know, we can um, sometimes move that around some in order to make sure that we're uh, serving uh, the needs that of our of, of your organizations. So with that, thanks everybody for being on, and um, we will um, talk with you soon.